अहंबंत तीसरण सह पंच शीलानी याहंबंत तीसरण सह पंच शीलानी याचा तटियांपी अहंबंत तीसरण सह पंच शीलानी याचा नमो तस भगवत अर्हत सम्मास 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 बुधंग शरण गच्छामि बुधंग शरण गच्छामि धम्मंग शरण गच्छामि धम्मंग शरण गच्छामि संगं शरण गच्छामि संगं शरण गच्छामि दुतियं पि बुधं शरण गच्छामि दुतियं पि बुधं शरण गच्छामि दुतियं पि धम्मं शरण गच्छामि दुतियं पि धम्मं शरण गच्छामि दुतियं पि संगं शरण गच्छामि दुतियं पि संगं शरण गच्छामि तटियं पि बुधं शरण गच्छामि तटियं पि बुधं शरण गच्छामि तटियं पि धम्मं शरण गच्छामि तटियं पि धम्मं शरण गच्छामि तटियं पि संगं शरण गच्छामि तटियं पि संगं शरण गच्छामि ते शरण गमनं नितितं आमा बन्धे पानाति पातावे रमणि सिखा पदं समाधियामि पानाति पातावे रमणि सिखा पदं समाधियामि अदिन्ना ामी ोधाये One forty-five, Punavada Sutta, advice to Punya. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati and Jetta's Grove, and at Appendika's Park. Then, when it was evening, the Venerable Punya rose from meditation and went to the Blessed One. Note thirteen fifteen. This Punya is a different. From Punya Amanta Puta of MN24, he was from a family of merchants residing in the port city of Suparaka in the Sunaparanta County, country, present-day Maharashtra. 
On a business trip to Savati, he heard the Buddha give a discourse and renounce the home life to become a bhikkhu. After paying homage to the Blessed One, he sat down at one side and said to him, Venerable Sir, it would be good if the Blessed One would give me brief advice. Having heard the Dhamma from the Blessed One, I will abide alone, withdrawn, diligent, ardent, and resolute. Well then, Punya, listen and attend carefully to what I shall ask, what I shall say. Yes, Venerable Sir, Venerable Punya replied. The Blessed One said this. Punya, there are forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. If a buku delights in them, welcome them, and remains holding to them, delight arises in him. With the arising of delight, Punya, there is the arising of suffering, I say. Note 1316. M.A. explains this instruction as a short teaching on the Four Noble Truths. Delight, nandi, is an aspect of craving. Through the arising of delight in regard to the eye and forms, there arises the suffering of the five aggregates. Thus, in this first part of the instruction, the Buddha teaches the round of existence by way of the first two truths, suffering and its origin, as they occur through the six senses. In the second part, paragraph four, he teaches the ending of the round by way of the second two truths, cessation and the path expressed as the abandoning of delight in the six senses and their objects. In our punya, sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the mind, mind objects cognizable by the mind that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire, and provocative of lust. If a bhikkhu delights in them, welcomes them, and remains holding to them, delight arises in him. With the arising of delight, Punya, there is the arising of suffering, I say. Uh, Punya, there are forms cognizable by the eye, sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue, tangibles cognizable by the body, mind objects cognizable by the mind that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and provocative of lust. If a bhikkhu does not delight in them, welcome them, and remain holding to them, the light ceases in him. With the cessation of the light, punya, there is a cessation of suffering, I say. Now that I have given you this brief advice, punya, in which country will you dwell? Venerable sir, now that the Blessed One has given me this brief advice, I am going to dwell in the Sunaparanta country. Punya, the people of Sunaparanta are fierce and rough. If they abuse and threaten you, what will you think then? Venerable Sir, if the people of Sunaparanta abuse and threaten me, then I shall think these people of Sunaparanta are excellent, truly excellent, and that they did not give me a blow with the fist. Then I shall think thus, blessed one. Then I shall think thus, sublime one. Punya, if the people of Sunaparanta do give you a blow with the fist, what will you think then? Venerable sir, if the people of Sunaparanta do give me a blow with the fist, then, I'll, then I shall think... These people of Sunaparanta are excellent, truly excellent, in that they did not give me a blow with the clod. I'll think thus, blessed one, then I shall think thus, sublime one. But, Punya, uh, if the people of Sunaparanta give you a blow with the clod, what will you think then? Venerable sir, if the people of Sunaparanta do give me a blow with a clod, then I shall think, These people of Sunaparanta are excellent, truly excellent, in that, that they did not give me a blow with a stick. Then I shall think thus, Blessed One, then I shall think thus, Sublime One. But Punya, if the people of Sunaparanta do give you a blow with a stick, what will you think then? Venerable Sir, 
If the people of Sunaparanta do give me a blow with a stick, then I shall think, these people of Sunaparanta are excellent, truly excellent, in that that they did not give me a blow with a knife. Then I shall think thus, blessed one, then I shall think thus, sublime one. But Punya, if the people of Sunaparanta do give you a blow with a knife, what will you think then? Venerable sir, if the people of Sunaparanta do give me a blow with a knife, then I shall think. These people of Sunaparanta are excellent, truly excellent, in that they have not taken my life with a sharp knife. Then I shall think thus, blessed one, then I shall think thus, sublime one. But Punya, if the people of Sunaparanta do take your life with a sharp knife, what will you think then? Venerable sir, if the people of Sunaparanta do take my life with a sharp knife, then I shall think thus. There have been disciples of the Blessed One who, being repelled, humiliated and disgusted by the body and by life, have sought an uh, assailant. But I have obtained this assailant without even a search. Then I shall think thus, blessed one. Then I shall think thus, sublime one. Good, good, Puna. Possessing such self-control and peacefulness, you will be able to dwell in, in the Suna Paranta country. Now, Puna, it is time to do as you think fit. Then, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's words, the Venerable Puna rose from his seat and after paying hom homage to the Blessed One, departed keeping him on his right. He then set his resting place in order, took his bowl and outer robe and set out to wander towards the Sunaparanta country. Wandering by stages, he eventually arrived in the Sunaparanta country, and there he lived. Then, during that reigns, the Venerable Puna established 500 men lay followers and 500 women lay followers in the practice, and he himself realized the three true knowledges. On a later occasion, the Venerable Puna attained final Nibbana. Note 1317. That is, he expired, since the Buddha still refers to Puna as, as a clansman Kula Puta. He must have died within a short time after returning to the Suna Paranta country. The text leaves no record of who, uh, how he died. The version of this sutta at SN 3588 says that he expired during his first rains retreat there. End of note. Then a number of bhikkhus went to the, went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told him, Venerable Sir, the clansman Purna, who who was given brief advice by the Blessed One, has died. What is his destination? What is his future cause? Because the, the clansman Punga was wise, he practiced in accordance with the Dhamma and did not trouble me in the inter interpretation of the Dhamma. The clansman Punga has attained final Nibbana. That is what the Blessed One said. The Bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Uh, by the three knowledges, is it, is it meant uh, Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta? Where well, he realized the three, three true knowledges. Paragraph 7. Oh, it means Trivija. And what is meant by that? I can't remember the exact uh, three knowledges. Let me look it up. Okay, yeah. Tivija is uh, Upe Nivasana Sati, uh, 
තිබ්බ චක්‍ර නාසවක් කියනවා පුබෙනියෝසන සතිස රිමෙම්බරින් ඔෆ් වන්ස් ෆෝමර් ලයිෆ්ස් පාස් ලයිෆ්ස් තිබ්බ චක්‍ර ඉස් දිවානයි ඇන් නාසවක් කේස් එක්ස්ටෙන්ෂන් ඔෆ් ඕල් ඩිෆයිල්මන්ට්ස් මෙන්ටල් ඩොක්සිකන්ට්ස් ඕකේ තැන්ක් යු සංකර් වෙල්කම් so there's a long story about how venerable uh, punya converted 500 men and women to buddhist it's in the commentary is uh, uh, it was a uh, lot of details which is not included in this sutta it's a quite extraordinary story yes i i also think so this sutta is like is 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 very touching Sanka do you have any idea about uh, what what is uh, here what is the what is the current name of Suna Paranta country well, there are uh, i think the north says it is uh, maharashtra but uh, there are other beliefs people think that it refers to certain arabic countries not sure yes because uh, you know uh, the people of maharashtra wouldn't uh, i don't think because uh, people of maharashtra uh, the as the story suggests uh, people of Mar- maharashtra are, are they're pretty known with uh, the buddha and the dhamma so maybe it's is some other country yeah because after uh, the story ends uh, they uh, establish the, those people in the dhamma so it's no surprise that they are buddhist if they are buddhist uh, i think the maharashtra is something big body is guessing not uh, i think from the text I have two questions but they're related um i i may have missed was there an explanation as to why he chose to go to this place this country that he knew the people were fierce and rough yes I, it's in the commentary because he wasn't able to progress in his meditation he thought it would be better to go to his uh, home country for that i think he kept changing places due to different reasons okay so what i get from this is that he's not avoiding this place um because of like the people being fierce and rough um but what i don't understand and it seems kind of delusional to me so there's something i'm not understanding for me to have this perception is why he's commenting that it's um in every situation like what if this what if that what if the people react like this but he comments that uh, these people they're excellent they're truly excellent in that they did not give me um a blow or they did not do this or so i don't know it seems delusional to me in a sense um that he would add this as if they're excellent instead of just leaving it as neutral like um it is what it is is that because he's still on the path and he's not an arahant is that why he's making these these comments that they're being excellent the people no he wasn't an arahant uh, at that time but this is a way of uh, preventing aversion from arising from in your mind like if you are, if you are uh practicing metta you uh, you see the the proximate cause of metta is seeing the lovable nature of people seeing the likable aspect of people so you compare this not that's versus this so you uh try to view it in a positive way so that gives rise to metta in your mind this is a form of a uh, practice to keep to guard your own mind to prevent aversion from arising okay so i guess it counterbalances in yeah, a way so he he is seeing the positive side of it always like he's not focusing on uh the bad side which would give rise to uh anger or hatred 
So he's focusing on the positive side and then he's protecting his mind that way. And, and also there is that uh, fact of if you were uh, if if you were born as a human being you 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 have done some excellent deeds for which you were born as a human so just being a human it is like it, it can be something uh, excellent because not every every being gets a human uh, human life i'll say so uh, the the possibility of a human mind uh, but what how how the capability of a human mind that they, they are really excellent so uh, what he is doing he is not refer, referring to the person itself but uh, i think he is more of like referring to the mind and, uh, and that kind of things like like his his mind and uh, like just being a human and uh, that's the that's an excellent thing that's why i that's what i think I mean, I was wondering the same, similar thing uh, as Julie did. Like, uh, I think only just for bearing or bearing whatever is coming is enough, no? Just being objective, understanding that there's a reason that they behave like this and there's a reason that they behave towards you like this. Yeah, I don't understand either the Well that that would be that would be upekka uh, which is different from uh, mm -hmm. how you practice metta. Upekka is you focus on like cause and effect uh, in terms of karma. This is your bad karma or good karma or people come into misfortune because of their own doings. Things like you think like that then you develop upekka. Mm. It doesn't necessarily develop uh, metta. Um, can you remind me what upeka mean in English? Upeka is yeah, equanimity. Non-partial, non-partial towards this or that. So could it be that he chose on purpose to go there because he knew he had to work on his aversion, because he uh, otherwise he could just go on with practicing mindfulness, but here he. Uh, specifically goes there to uh, practice loving kindness as I understand it now to support his practice well, according to the commentary uh, his kamatahana uh, kamatana didn't work uh, in Jetavana or in Savati so he thought this uh, place is not good for my practice let me go find a suitable place so he uh, went to the Buddha and asked permission to go. I have a question, uh, not related to this, uh, to this sutta, but um, I have a question regarding uh, Vavna. And uh, um, if anyone can tell me that, uh, what, uh, what is the definition of Vavna and uh, how to do it properly? Yeah, so Vavna is mindfulness, actually. Uh, if you if you look for the English translation, most likely I think uh, it, is, it is similar to mindfulness. Bhavana in our language means any kind of meditation. Yeah, meditation, my, mindfulness, yeah. or metta or anything. Right. I thought I thought it's more like a development, Sankar, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. It means uh, meditation uh, in the sense, in a Buddhist sense, mental development. Development, yes. Okay. I mean, <laughs> you don't call aimless uh, contemplation bhavana, like <laughs> people. Exactly. Think you know, yeah, yeah. Thing. It literally means uh, causing to be. Causing to be. You you mean bhava? Maybe? Yeah, the no, word no, bhavana comes bhavana. from bhava, bhava but uh, the way bhava I think... different. Yeah, yeah, bhava is different, but the, I think uh, uh, this the way I think the government Miranda asks bhavana, uh, we also use that bhavana. And the way we use it for meditation and mindfulness, the that particular word. 
So going back to the Sutta Sankha, um, it starts out with the Buddha. I mean, I don't think the Buddha gave this specific teaching to him, right? So the teaching is about, you know, the senses and some object that is wished for, desired, agreeable, likable, etc. So it's not about something that he dislikes or, uh, you know, so not the challenge, I wow. think, in his mind is the, is the positive objects, right? Yeah, yeah. It's not the, the story about the Sunna Parante is uh, completely separate from with the teaching given by the Buddha. It's not uh, like yeah. uh, the people uh, at Sun living in Sunaparanta are known were known to be rough and uh, mm -hmm. uh, not very pleasant. So that is a separate thing that he had to handle with metta. Doesn't mean that is his uh, metta is his uh, main uh, meditation uh, advice. I see a connection. Isn't there a connection, like, if you are attached to these pleasant things, you know, then it's better for you to challenge yourself not having those pleasant things. Yeah, I but think. the thing is, according to the commentary, he kept changing his places due to various reasons. So uh, it's pleasant for him, probably, right? No, there was a place where the... Uh, 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 the sound of the ocean was very loud, so he couldn't concentrate. So he changed. Okay. And then there was a place where animals keep uh, making noises day and night. So he changed again. I mean, it's a very interesting description, the story. Uh, I will, if I have time, I'll try to translate it to English. So, do we know which kind, of, which punna is this? Because I heard a different punna as well. It, yeah, isn't, this is isn't not the person uh, who is like, super, like the one that is super uh, ill in the end of his life. No, no, this is not that one. This is different one. That one was with uh, Sariputta and... Uh, uh, we, we read that sutta before, right? Yeah, yeah. My question is, um, in this paragraph, uh, the Buddha seems to give instruction not related to meditation practice. So he said, if a book could light in them, welcome them and remind holding to them, the lights arise in him. Mm -hmm. So it seems that uh, some a bhikkhu should be uh, able to do not delight in them, even though when he's not in meditation, in a formal meditation practice. But, uh, so my question but, is... So, so how, try, try answering your question, uh, Claudia. So how, how can someone not delight in these objects? How is it possible? So, by if you, if you think that's not meditation practice, is it possible? Like sometimes, for example, for me, it happened that uh, just an example, an example, right? I I know that I want something, and uh, I un intellectually understand that this one is not good, and so I just refrain from it. And I'm not uh, noting anything. I just don't do it because of that um, that uh, understanding. So I w this was my question. Actually, was like uh, med meditation definitely, you know, like uh, helps and bring you in that path. But then, you know, I think that people can also refrain from those danger with the an intellectual understanding of it, not only through meditation. I don't know if I'm... Well, basically, the Buddha is talking about the third noble truth here. He's uh, making a point about uh, the cause of suffering. 
So it is meditation practice. It is. So I I just wanted to go further and ask you like when you think you you make this decision decision you know or to refrain or restrain, you still have mm. wisdom about it, right? You see it as as harmful. I think so. Yes. And you you make a decision in a moment, right? That's right. So that one, this is was my question actually. So that one also is meditate. Of course, when like when someone is listening to the Buddha, you know, giving a discourse and they become enlightened, you still, I mean, you still meditate. You you are still mindful. You are still not aloof. Yeah, thank you. You answer to my question. Thank you. It is said uh, there is no uh, teaching of the Buddha without the meditation practice. Without meditation. Yeah. There's no sermon of the Buddha without meditation. I feel like I don't even understand the sutta if I don't, you know, just a little bit. No, that is it. important because uh, I was thinking uh, meditation only as... Uh, you know, sitting and, uh, you know, doing the practice of denoting. And no, uh, I did. meditation is every moment. Sati is every moment. Even now. Here. Yeah. Thank you, Edith. Formal practice is important, though. But it's important for, for, for this, for your everyday practice or every moment practice so if you do more formal practice it will become more of a habit but also you have the opportunity to correct your practice so your practice will be you know you'll know when are you mindful truly uh, so during the day or whatever you're hearing or sitting or walking or pouring a tea or something, you can be present with it. You're washing the dishes and that's that's how it will in, in translate to your life, to your every moment. Yes, definitely it does. And um, I recognize when I am mindful or restraining, let's say, and I also recognize when I am not when I am not, I recognize it off, obviously later when I have already done it. But, but yeah, my my Do idea see, of meditation. Sorry. Do you see a difference when you are practicing a lot? How you behave during, you know, when you are not practicing actually actively, like it's different. Your mind is more pure, even. Without, uh, you know, outside of the uh, formal practice. But if you practice just a little, a few minutes a day, or you skip practicing, your mind will be more and more muddled. Yeah, this one I cannot say because um, I, I never stop since I start. So I think that for oh, me was a great. gradually, you know, gradually. I do. I do for that. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. I wanted to mention that there are actually a lot of stories, and I think that's also the case today, where people get enlightened during daily activities, during simple th uh, tasks. Oh, yeah. So it's yeah, not necessarily doing meditation. It's just the warming up, let's say. So then during the key moments, you, you have to you are ready. Oh, Sanka, do you remember the bhikkhuni who got enlightened um, by warming up the water for cooking? And oh, by doing... stirring the pot or something like that? Yes. I do vaguely remember. I can't, I can't recall the name. Me neither. So there was a bikini who didn't feel like going on arms around and told her peers that, oh, I'm I'm not going. I <laughs> just, just stayed home. And uh, 
realize that all these chores, it's like just meaningless and pointless. Very simple thing. Become, became an arahant. I think the other ones came back and they were saying like, you, you didn't do anything. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Edit. Thank you all. Sad.